Hi, I'm Ruben Lara, and today we'll be talking about one of my favorite illustration software applications, Clip Studio Paint. In the over 20 years I've been painting digitally, I find that Clip Studio is one of the few packages that combines the stability and flexibility of Photoshop with the natural brush media engines of applications like Painter and Sketchbook Pro. Clip Studio is highly customizable, which can be overwhelming. So I've assembled a short list of tools and features that will not only help new users focus on the basic setups you'll need to get started, but will also help experienced Photoshop artists find their way to familiar workflows. If you're watching this video through a local media player, there are chapter markers to help you reference specific features when you need them later on. All right, let's get started. The first thing to love about Clip Studio is the price. It's normally only $50, but they're always having sales that bring it down to as low as 20. But even at $50, it's worth every cent. It's a very powerful piece of software. It's available for installation on Windows and Mac, as you can see. And I believe that for every purchase, you're allowed to register it on up to three different machines. I know I have mine installed on two different Apple computers, uh, but I also have a, a Cintiq Companion, which I love by the way, that runs Windows and the same registration works there. The files open seamlessly on both platforms and uh, the experience is exactly the same as far as I can tell. So it's just a great piece of software to be working in. All right, diving right into the software, we'll open Clip Studio Paint, give ourselves a new file here. Let's jump right into exploring just some of the basic tools. I'll go ahead and start with the pencil. And uh, everything you see here is default installation, stock tools. So this is exactly what you're going to get once you install. I'll just start with the rough pencil here. And even just this basic pencil, just start with a nice uh, gray color, just feels good. It um, has just the right amount of texture. And of course, everything in Clip Studio is configurable. Um, but it has, feels like it has tooth on the paper and is very natural. Moving on to the ink pens, their default ink pen is called the G pen. And really this is just such a joy to use. It's so smooth and silky. Uh, they have a stabilization feature here, which I think accounts for that nice smooth control that you just feel when you're using it. You may notice it a little more on the video, but there's just there's a slight uh, lag between the actual tip of the, of the pen and the line, but you don't notice it as a user and that's I think what allows your brain to kind of just have a little bit more of that coordination to feel like you you just have total control over your over your inking.
All right, moving on to the paintbrush tools. This is where I really think Clip Studio sings. Um, just the default oil paint flat brush uh, immediately feels like it's a mixing brush. You can already see that uh, the initial strokes are, you know, have that weight and the density of the paint. And as I start to, you know, scrub into that red, it really just starts to mix. And that's all controllable using the amount of paint and density of paint and color stretch sliders here on the side of the in the tool palette. Of course, I can go ahead and start sampling colors in between. Start getting some really nice mixes and and blending of paint. And that's just using this paintbrush at its full opacity right out of the box. When we start combining it with uh, other tools like the uh, blender tools, I'll just use this soothing watercolor for now, you quickly get a sense of how traditional and natural you can start getting your paints to look. Let's go ahead and set some preferences that will help us to start working a little more efficiently and also to work a little bit more like Photoshop in some respects. So Clip Studio allows you to use keyboard shortcuts to change your brush size in addition to just the brush size slider you see in the tool property. By holding down Option and Command and dragging on the canvas left and right, we quickly are able to change the brush size, just like in Photoshop by holding down control and option. So in Clip Studio, it's option and command. I like to use this all the time and it really speeds up my workflow. Something that helps me speed it up even more so is mapping that to the front of my Wacom tablet pen or stylus. So let's go here to System Preferences. We'll open our Wacom, Wacom tablet preferences. Let's add an application so that what we're gonna map only applies when we're in Clip Studio. So I'm making sure I'm on my grip pen, I'm on Clip Studio Paint, and we'll change the front button to a modifier and we'll go ahead and select option and command and hit OK. As soon as we come back to Clip Studio, now just pressing the front rocker button on my stylus gives me access to the option and command key presses. So I can quickly be painting, I'm on my soothing watercolor there, I can quickly be painting and have immediate access to the size of that brush. Next let's head over to our preferences panel and set under interface a theme of color combination to a dark color. And I like to have it all the way at the bottom. Of course you can set it to your liking. And this just gives us a nice contrasty gray color on the background of our canvas as well as all of our UI to help us gauge color a little more accurately and it's just a little easier on the eyes. And I know that more recent versions of Photoshop are doing the same. One of the very powerful things about Clip Studio is the ability to map just about any action in the software to some kind of hotkey. So let's do that now for the opacity settings on our brush. Now in Photoshop, uh, by default, the numbers one through zero are mapped to 10% to 100% opacity for any brush that you're working on. But it's not set that way by default in Clip Studio. So let's go ahead and do that now. We'll go to shortcut settings and make sure that we're on the Options submenu. If we go to Tool Property Palette and then Ink, we have a set opacity to these different percentages. And as you can see, they're not mapped to anything. So let's do that now. I'm double clicking, hitting the number one, and just double clicking all the way down the line to set all those. Now it's telling us zero is already in use. And as soon as we just click anywhere else in the palette, it'll alert us to that which I'm okay with, I'll say yes and hit okay. And now if I hit one, we're automatically mapped down to 10%, as you can see in the tool property slider 
20, 30, and so forth. Another powerful feature about the shortcut system is that you can map multiple tools to one letter. So by default, if I click B on the keyboard, it'll take me to my brush subtool. And if I hit B again, it'll take me to airbrush. And if I hit B again, it'll take me to these special effects brushes. Now this isn't super helpful for me because I don't often use those brushes and I prefer to have the B key mapped only to my paint brushes. So let's do that now. I'll go shortcut settings. This time we'll go into tool. And sure enough, as you can see, B is mapped to brush, to airbrush, and to the decoration subcategory. I'm just gonna select that, delete it, and I prefer not to have my airbrush so immediately accessible since I don't use it when I'm painting that often. And now when I hit OK and I click B multiple times, it just stays on my brush subtool because that's the only thing that it's mapped to. But you can also map keys to individual tools as well. So if I unmap the B from the tool subcat uh, from the brush subcategory, I can map it directly to, for example, the oil paint flat brush and also the smooth watercolor brush. Now when I hit B, it'll flip between those two. So depending on the way you work, uh, you can set your own obviously, but you can also go ahead and save and register different workspaces which will also save your hotkey mappings. For example, if you have a, a subset for inking and another one for, for painting, another one for concept, uh, you can go ahead and set all those just how you like it. So I'm gonna go ahead and map my main uh, category to brush and I'll remove it from the individual ones. And that way my B always goes to my, yet, my last used brush. Another feature I love about Clip Studio is its canvas flipping feature. If I come here to view, rotate, invert, and flip horizontal, um, it flips the canvas uh, not only horizontally as it obviously is supposed to do, but it also keeps my, my center where I was. So if I'm working over here on you know the back of the jaw and I flip this, unflip it, it'll keep it to that same area. Now one thing you may notice is how fast it is. Unlike Photoshop, it's not actually taking all the pixels and flipping them in the document, which up until, until most recent versions of Photoshop is, I believe it's what's happening under the hood in Photoshop, which makes it really slow. And if you have a huge, you know, two gigabyte document, flipping it can be very time consuming and, and take a big toll on your memory resources. But in Clip Studio, it's just flipping the viewport. And uh, to show this, let's go ahead and uh, flip this. And we'll go ahead and save this out. And we'll save it out as a Photoshop document on the desktop. So right now I flipped it and the dinosaur is facing right. So if I close that and open it again, you see that it's back facing left. That's because that's the original state of the document. The viewport flip is just that, just a view viewport flip. And because they've done it this way, it makes it very fast and very powerful. Let's go ahead and set a hotkey for that. This time we'll go to the main menu, view, rotate, invert, flip horizontal. I'll set mine to F. Now our F key very quickly flips. Another feature I love about any of the brushes in Clip Studio is the ability to paint with transparency. Now what that means is that I can come here to, let's just stick with our oil paint, oil paint flat brush and lay down some, uh, some marks. And I can always uh, hit the E key, go to my hard eraser and start erasing out you know, to transparency just like you can in most software applications. The only problem is oftentimes I'm wanting to erase out with the same textured brush that I'm using to paint with and I obviously don't have that brush in my eraser set. Now I can go and create an eraser or, or duplicate one of the subtools and then turn it into eraser mode and actually create another tool. But that would very quickly clutter up my interface and just double the amount of brushes I have in my subtool categories. Instead, what Clip Studio allows you to do is paint with transparency. As you can see here, my foreground color is blue, my background color is white. But if I select this little transparent box option, immediately my, that exact same brush turns into essentially an eraser and even respects the pressure I'm giving it. As you can see on the edges, it's you know erasing out at a, at a lower 
opacity because that's what this brush does in paint mode. Now the shortcut for that is the letter C. That means while I'm painting, I can hit C and flip between paint mode or paint with opacity mode and paint with transparency mode. So here I am painting with this color, moving along, hit C and all of a sudden I'm able to erase out and now I'm painting again and now I'm erasing out. This works with any of the tools which makes it a very very handy feature and really speeds up the workflow. I really like this feature. Next let's talk about a feature that has recently been introduced to Photoshop but has been around in Clip Studio for a while now. That's the ability to press and hold any tool shortcut to temporarily access another tool. So for example we know that our B is set to our oil paint flat brush, our P is our ink and G pen and our J is set to our soothing watercolor blender brush. So I'll just come back to my oil paint flat brush for a second and just paint in a few marks there. If I hit J because I want to blend, well obviously that takes me to my blender, I have to go back and hit B to go back to my brush. But if I press and hold J without letting go, it temporarily accesses the blender and as soon as I let go, it goes right back to the last brush that I was on makes it very, very efficient to paint because now I don't have to keep looking down on my keyboard to find out where J and B is. I can just hold my finger on J, paint, blend, paint, and blend. Really speeds things up. Now might be a good time to talk about uh, another feature that has always irritated me a little bit in Photoshop is its inability to paint complete straight lines when I'm using my Wacom tablet. Always works on the mouse, but doesn't work on the tablet for some reason. Uh, in Clip Studio, it works as advertised. If I click an initial point there, move over here and hit the shift key, I immediately get uh, an indicator of what is going to happen with that line. And as soon as I click, it gives me exactly what I expect to have. Let's talk a little bit about brush settings that can be accessed by the tool property palette. You'll notice that different tools have different kinds of settings exposed in this panel. For example, the G pen has brush size, opacity, stabilization, whereas the pastel has brush size, opacity, combined mode, etc. And others still have no opacity. And you're wondering, well, how can I expose that? Well, that's where the subtool detail panel comes into play. By clicking this little wrench icon, we get a list of all the potential settings that any of the brushes can have. So all the brushes are some kind of combination of one of these categories. Now in the case of the noise, where we don't see the opacity, simply by turning on the eyeball in the opacity sliders in the subtool detail, we can expose that setting inside the tool property palette and have it available to us as we're painting. So on a brush by brush basis, you can simplify or increase the number of options available to you at any given time. One thing I was looking for for a long time was how to adjust the look and feel of the texture of the brush. Well, if we go into our subtool detail, we'll see that the majority of the look of the brush is controlled by the material that is applied to the brush shape, just like you would expect. So if we go here to brush shape, or brush tip rather, we can see that this particular brush is made up of a material and it's made up of this particular file. We can add more materials to this by clicking the little paper icon and basically searching through one of many, many different alpha channels or alphas that uh, Clip Studio has embedded into it. So I can easily attach foliage 8 to this and now this, com this brush will be a combination of both of those textures. I'll just get rid of this one for now. So if you're looking for a smaller version of that particular texture to be applied to this brush, then it's as simple as registering a new material, which I'll show you how to do in a second. But each brush also can be paired with a canvas texture. Let's go to a brush that doesn't have any particular brush shape, like the G pen, as you can see, is just a flat circle. And let's go to the texture panel, and we can see that nothing has been applied there. I'll click here. It immediately knows we're looking for some kind of paper or surface texture, and we'll just choose something like, well, let's just choose the canvas. You can see immediately that now this brush is being applied over a canvas texture. This can be scaled and its density can be adjusted. So let's go ahead and scale that canvas texture up and you can immediately see its effect in the brush stroke. Increasing the density basically increases the contrast. You can reverse it 
or emphasize it. Now, of course, you likely wouldn't use a texture with something like GPen, so I'll get rid of that. But we may use it in the case of something like a chalk brush. So if we come in here to our pastels and we open chalk, this already has a rough textured material applied to it. We can change it or scale it up and you can immediately see the effect on that brush. So this is good to be aware of so that we know exactly where each aspect of the texture is coming from. Sometimes you want to create a new brush of your own. Let's see how to do that now. I'll create a new layer. And the basic steps are creating a shape, registering it as a new material, and then applying it to a new brush. Let's create a shape. I'll go here to my lasso tool and just select polyline. What you see here is called the selection launcher. It can be really helpful when you're working on a tablet or when you're doing a lot of selecting. At other times, it just gets in the way and can be a nuisance. I'll turn that off here. View selection launcher. Now when I create a selection, nothing shows up. Command D to deselect. Okay, let's grab our rectangle marquee tool, create a selection, Make sure those pixels are accessible on the layer that I've drawn on. And come here and say, Edit, Register Image as Material. Let's name it Blocks01. I can set a location to save this material. It doesn't really matter where you save it, but it's helpful to put it in some kind of category for future use. I'll say this is a monochromatic pattern. And we want to use this for a brush tip shape. Now, if we don't check this, it won't show up in the brush options. So we wanna make sure to do that. We we'll hit okay. The first thing to recognize is you can always access it again by going to your materials subcategory. If I come here to monochrome, there is our blocks one. This palette will always show all the alphas and all the images available to you for the different Clip Studio functionality. I'll close that. Let's start off by going to a brush that's most like the kind of brush we want to create. Right now, I just want to create a blocking in concept inking brush with a very specific shape. So I'm going to go to the G pen, duplicate the subtool, and name it. I'll just call it block concept, and you can give it any one of these icons. We'll hit OK. All right, there's our block concept. Now we'll go into the tool settings come into the brush tip, say we want to use a material for this, add a material, and here we'll type in block. And there's our blocks one. Select it, hit OK. There, we should be set up. Coming back here, deselecting, and we've set up our brush shape. Now you'll notice there's some spacing issues there, so let's go back in here. and the gap is gonna affect how close together these shapes are showing up. Let's just go ahead and start with the narrow and see if that does it for us. And for the most part it does. I'm hitting zero to go to 100%. But we still notice that there is some kind of noticeable gap when we zoom in. So for that, we're just gonna to go to the fixed and set this to its lowest setting, which is 0.1. That now gives us a nice clean brush stroke. Looks great. Now we can use this to easily create 
text silhouettes like a spaceship or for whatever else we might be working on. Now the only problem with this is that when we change colors, we still get black. And that's because the kind of image that was used to capture the image material was set as a color layer. If a brush has been set using an image that was drawn on a color layer, then it will always use the color that that particular image was originally drawn in. Now that may not seem very helpful, but you can imagine how helpful it would be to always have a blue roughened pencil or always have a red pencil that no matter what color the color wheel is set to, that brush is always that color. And this is the way this brush is behaving now. Well, what if we wanted to create a brush that was able to be painted in any one of the colors? Well, for that, we need to make sure that we go back to the layer that our brush image is set to. And we're gonna look at the layer property panel for a moment and see that the expression of this layer has been set to color. Let's click this and choose gray. Now that the pixels are set to gray, let's create the selection once more. Make sure we're on our layer. Edit, register images material. Let's call this block one gray. Use for brush tip shape, monochromatic pattern. Okay. Come back to our block concept. Go into the settings. Go to the brush tip. Get rid of that one. Delete. New. And we'll use block one gray. Deselect. Now our new brush can be used in any one of the colors indicated by the color wheel. I find Clip Studio's brush tools and settings to be just as powerful as Photoshop's. Of course, many people are creating and selling custom brushes online, so you may find just what you're looking for elsewhere. A brush pack I swear by and I absolutely love is created by a guy named Frendon. He creates Photoshop brushes as well as Manga Studio 5. This is a good time to mention that Manga Studio 5 and Clip Studio Paint are exactly the same program, just rebranded under a different name. I'm not sure why both are being developed, but there must be some good reason. Either way, brushes that work in Manga Studio also work in Clip Studio and vice versa. I've purchased and downloaded the Frendon MS5 V3 Combo Pack. It's a great set of inkers, paint brushes, and pencils that I've used over and over. Now, one small irritation I do have with Clip Studio is it doesn't allow for a clear way of importing multiple brushes at once. So most people that end up importing brushes often do the obvious thing, which is going to one of these menus, saying import subtool, finding their brush pack, and then finding they can't shift multiple select a variety or at least more than one brush. That can be frustrating if you have a lot of brushes to import. Fortunately, there's another way, but it's not very clear. Here are the steps. Make sure you either hide or close any open documents so that you have a clear view of both the Clip Studio user interface and the finder window that contains your downloaded brushes. Now, if I click on the finder window, my Clip Studio UI disappears. So here's the trick. First, select the brushes that you want to import. In this case, I'm just going to import the inking brushes. So I'll select and shift select all the way to the end of the inking brushes. I'll come back to my Clip Studio, hide my active documents, and in one fell swoop, without actually clicking and letting go, I'm going to click and drag from the finder right into my subtool ink category. Give it a second. And sure enough, they all import at once. This will save you a lot of time. Let's talk for a moment about the layer palette. One feature I often use is also found in the layer property palette, and that's this mode called layer color. Let me turn off my ink and turn on my pencils. Bring that back up to 100%. Sometimes when I'm inking, I prefer that the colors in my sketch layer be different than black. Of course, I could just reduce opacity or I could lock the pixels, choose a color, and fill it. But then I find that I want them to be black again for some other reason. Either way, those are multiple steps that I have to take. Instead, the layer property layer color immediately turns that layer to the color indicated in the layer color panel. Super handy. 
You can easily change this to a color of your preference and then turn it on and off when needed. Coming from Photoshop, another question I had for a long time was, where are the channels? I would often use channels to save selections for later. Instead, Clip Studio has something called Selection Layer. Let's see what that looks like. So I'll take my Pencils layer and Command click it to turn that layer into a selection. Just like in Photoshop, we get a series of marching ants. They don't look as good, but they still behave the same way. I'll come here to Selection and say Convert to Selection Layer. I now get a new selection, a new layer in my Layers palette called Selection 1, which I can rename. And if I happen to delete this, I can always double click on this small green selection icon to invoke that selection again, just like reloading a selection from the channels palette in Photoshop. I'll make a new layer, hide that, and fill it with black. One of the nice things about the selection layer is you can just paint on it like any normal layer. So I'll come here and grab my oil paint flat brush, do some painting. Now when I double click, those marks are now part of my selection. At other times, we may have used Photoshop channels to create some kind of complex transparent selection from a grayscale image. That's easy enough to do with a very powerful feature called register brightness to opacity. Let's see how that works. So I've looked up a tree silhouette here. I'll just say view image and I'll hit shift control command four to copy a selection of my screen to clipboard. We'll come back to Clip Studio, paste that, grab the move tool, and we'll scale it up. We're losing a little bit of resolution, but that's okay. So as you can see, this is a, an, an opaque layer, and I'm looking to extract a very complex selection from this. All I have to do is say edit, convert brightness to opacity, and immediately Clip Studio has done a grayscale evaluation of the image and converted any variations in gray to actual transparency in that layer. I can go ahead and option select that, make a selection layer out of it, or just use it as is. For the last two features I want to show in the layers palette, I'll need a little bit more painting done on this dinosaur. Give me a minute. All right, now by far one of my favorite features is the ability to transform information across multiple layers at once. This is very powerful. Consider this file, for example. I have uh, a glow layer, an ink layer, and then a folder that contains yet another folder and a couple other layers of flat color. Now, let's say an art director comes and says, well, I like everything, except I want this front spike to be a little bit taller. Well, easily enough, I can grab my lasso tool, make this selection, and instead of having to go to every single layer individually and make that change, so obviously if I adjust the ink layer, I would have to come here down to the, to the flat layer, make that same adjustment down here, and you know of course go through each one of my layers. Instead, I can select my ink, select my flat. In fact, I can select my ink in an entire folder, hit Command T, and now the adjustments transform all the layers at once. That's amazing, and that's something you can't do in Photoshop. It's also gone into the masks of my correction layers and made those same adjustments. This becomes even more powerful when combined with Clip Studio's mesh transformation. So in this case, I'll even add my glow layer, select all the relevant information, and make a square selection. I don't even have to select all. All right. And we'll go into Edit, Transform, Mesh Transformation. This is going to give us uh, some options for number of horizontal and vertical uh, lattice points. So I'll just bump this up to six, and we'll say six there. Uh, let's say five. And uh, make whatever changes we'd like. Now, it is going through multiple layers here, so it's just going to be a little bit slower. So I'll bump that out there. Pull this down here. OK. 
Okay, double click to commit. And there's a result, a super powerful tool, especially when dealing with art directors who might make changes at the 11th hour. Well, those are some of my favorite tools and techniques in Clip Studio Paint. I hope this can help you get set up quickly, start painting efficiently, and enjoying Clip Studio as much as I do.